Welcome to section 20.2. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to continue our discussion on nuclear decay. So just to remind you, we're going to take an unstable nucleus and turn it into a stable nucleus. So this can happen using the reactions we discussed in our previous lecture. So what you guys see here is the decay of uranium-238 to lead-206. Now this is an overall reaction. At the start of the quarter, we told you guys that the overall reaction does not tell you the steps taken. The overall reaction can be composed of elementary steps or the path the reaction takes going from reactants to products. Right now, what we know is this process takes 14 steps. There are eight alpha decays and six beta emissions that that we have found thus far tracking this reaction of uranium-238 going to lead-206. Your book goes ahead and shows you each one of these steps we found thus far. It goes ahead and highlights which kind of decay it's going under and the half-life for each one of those processes. Now remember back when we started talking about kinetics. When we talked about kinetics, we said that if we had a multi-step reaction, the slowest step is the rate determining step. So even though there are multiple elementary steps in this reaction, really the reaction that's going to dictate how fast this is, is the slowest reaction. Now you guys can take a look at the half-lives. And remember, the half-lives give you an indicator of how fast a reaction is. Some of these half-lives are in seconds. You got some in minutes and days. There's even one that's about a billion years long. And so this happens to be the longest half-life. In other words, the slowest reaction. So this reaction is going to be considered our rate determining step. The one where uranium-238 becomes thorium-234. Now what you have to know about radioactive decay is that these processes are generally unimolecular. So if our rate determining step is unimolecular, that means that this reaction is going to follow first order kinetics. So all the tools that we discussed in our kinetics chapter are applicable to this decay. Since our rate determining step is unimolecular, we can use first order kinetics. That means we can use the first order integrated rate law and calculate half-life based off of first order kinetics. Now it's been some time, so let's go ahead and remind you what half-life means. We can go ahead and look at the decay of molybdenum-99. The half-life of molybdenum-99 is 67 hours. So what that means is that if I have a one milligram sample I wait 67 hours, and then I will have half a milligram. If I wait another 67 hours, I have 0.25, and then another 0.125. Now, this is showing you that it doesn't matter how much molybdenum I have. It is always going to take 67 hours for me to cut it in half. Now, this one has a relatively short half-life at 67 hours. If we go back to our previous slide, if I have a half-life that's 4.51 times 10 to the ninth years, that means it's going to take 4.51 times 10 to the ninth years for half of my uranium-238 to go away. This is a major concern when dealing with nuclear waste. When we generate nuclear waste, if my half-life is so long, well, it's going to take ages for my radioactive waste to finally go away. And there's nothing really that I can do to speed up the reaction. It's unimolecular. I can't go ahead and increase the concentration because you'll remember the half-life isn't dependent on concentration in a first order process. Okay, gentle people, let's warm ourselves up to doing kinetic reactions again. So here's a popular radioactive material that you can order when you're doing biological tracing. If you're in a research lab, you guys can order phosphorus-32, which has a half-life of 14.3 days. What I want you guys to do is calculate how much phosphorus-32 you would have after 5.5 days. 
So what I mean by that is calculate what percentage of phosphorus you have after 5.5 days. And after you're done running through this, just mark the right answer. All right, general people, let's go ahead and first start out with our first order rate law. So I'm gonna use the integrated rate law. I'm gonna have a concentration at some time, and it's gonna be dependent on my initial concentration times e to the minus kt. Now I need to go ahead and figure out k for this reaction. For a first order process, the T1 half is going to equal 0 0.693 divided by k, my rate constant. Or in other words, my rate constant k is going to equal 0 0.693 divided by my half-life. So I can go ahead and plug in my values, 0 0.693 divided by 14.3 days. And what I calculate out is 0 0.04846 days to the minus one. So before plugging that in, let's go ahead and rearrange my equation. So I'm gonna put our concentration over my initial concentration, e to the minus kt. I'm gonna go ahead and plug in my k value, and I'm gonna times it by the time, in this case, 5.5. Now, what I calculate out of this is 0 0.7660. And so remember, this is A over A naught. If I times this by 100%, it will tell me how much of my original material I have left. And in this case, 76.6% .6 of my original material remains. Now, I want you guys to understand what's happening here. So after about five days, about 75% of my material is left over, 25% of it has decayed. Whenever researchers order radioisotopes, they have to work fast. Even waiting a week, 25% of your material has just gone down the drain and is ineffective. And so that's why when you guys do radio tracing, you have to make sure that you plan your experiments well and you have everything ready to go, so as soon as they overnight you that radioactive material, you are ready to go because you are on this clock constantly. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that made sense, and remember to stay safe, Chem1C.